Um, yeah, I thought I would read a little something first. Um, just to introduce it, um, this is uh, Bad Monkey. It's about a woman named Jane Charlotte who is arrested for murder in Las Vegas. And um, during questioning, she tells police that she is the member of a secret organization that fights evil. And the division she works for within the organization is called the Department for the Final Disposition of Irredeemable Persons, or Bad Monkeys for short. Um, and it's an execution squad that goes around ridding the world of especially evil men. And the bad monkey's weapon of choice is something called an NC gun, which looks kind of like a toy pistol and shoots heart attacks and strokes instead of bullets. And the police, when they hear the story, are a little bit skeptical. So they um, put Jane in a little white room with a psychiatrist. And the novel is her telling the story of her career with the organization to this psychiatrist. Um, and the scene I wanted to read to you was um, the scene where Jane is uh, initially recruited by the organization, but just to set things up a little bit, Jane's first encounter with the organization takes place back when she's 14 years old, and she's born in San Francisco. Um, she's the daughter of a single mom, and she has a little brother named Phil. And as a teenager, she spends a lot of time fighting with her mother about whose responsibility it is to take care of Phil. Jane thinks it ought to be her mom's job, and um, her mother, who's working 12-hour days to support them, thinks Jane could maybe help out. But um, Jane doesn't like that, so they spend a lot of time fighting. And eventually, the fights get bad enough that Jane is sent away to live with her aunt and uncle in the San Joaquin Valley. In the um, town where they live there is called Siesta Corda, which, according to Jane, is Spanish for wake me if anything happens. Um, Jane is so bored that she actually begins reading for entertainment. and. Um, this is the 1970s, so there's no Harry Potter, so her reading drug of choice is Nancy Drew, which, given Jane's personality, is kind of an odd choice. But what draws her to it is Pamela Sue Martin, the actress who plays Nancy Drew on television. And um, Pamela Sue Martin sort of had this reputation as being uh, a bad girl off the set. So because of her, Jane has this idea that Nancy Drew is sort of a closet bad seed and, and therefore a perfect role model for her. Um, so she's reading Nancy Drew, and she starts going to high school in this sleepy little town, and quickly figures out that the janitor at the high school is actually a serial killer called the Angel of Death, who's been going up and down the highway, snatching little boys out of roadside restaurants. And um, she decides to get the goods on him. And at one point, she's actually in the guy's house looking for evidence when the phone rings. And um, she picks it up, and a voice on the other end says her name and says, you know, Jane, you shouldn't be messing around in there. This guy is a bad monkey. And what's happened is that Jane has wandered into the middle of a organization operation. They know about this guy, and they're getting ready to quietly do away with him, but she's blundered into it. And um, without totally spoiling what happens, she acquits herself well. And when it's all over, the organization um, leaves her a, a memento. It's this little gold coin with the words omnis mundum facimus inscribed in it. And, um, because Jane reads now, she's able to go to the library and figure out that this is Latin for we all make the world. And she doesn't know exactly what that means, but she figures it's probably the motto of the organization and that the fact that they've left her this coin means that they'll be calling on her again at some point. Um, but the wait takes a lot longer than she thinks. And it's actually another 20 years go by. And she's waiting and waiting to hear from these people. And um, meanwhile, it doesn't really do much with her life and um, falls into sort of a dissolute lifestyle. And that's where I pick up. Um. And one day I was on my way home when I passed by this payphone. And just on impulse, I picked up the receiver. There was no dial tone, but the phone wasn't dead. It was an open line. Hello, I said. There was no answer, but still it felt like someone was listening at the other end, so I said, if you're ever planning to call me back, do it soon. The next day, I got a jury duty summons in the mail. I'd gotten calls to jury duty before, and I was about due for another, so it could have been a coincidence, but maybe not. And either way, I figured this was an opportunity to finally do some good in the world, exactly what I'd been looking for. It was an arson murder trial. This guy, Julius Deeds, reputed gangster, found out his girlfriend was cheating on him and threw a gasoline bomb into her living room in the middle of the night. She escaped through the back door of the house, but she left three kids upstairs, and none of them made it out. So I was in the jury pool for this, and I was pretty psyched until it dawned on me that I'd met the defendant before. He'd been at my dealer's place the last time I went to make a buy. 
That's your drug dealer? Yeah, guy named Ganesh. May I ask what kind of drugs? The usual kind. Pot, of course, speed, Valium, Coke on special occasions, acid when I needed a cheap vacation. I know that probably sounds like a lot, but at that point in my life, I had it under control. Anyhow, the last time I'd gone to see Ganesh, about a month before the jury call, he'd come to the door looking scared. Now, Ganesh was always a little shaky. He'd studied to be an oncologist before flunking out of med school, and I'm guessing he had a failure manager playing 24-7 in his head. I was supposed to be curing cancer. Instead, I'm one bad day away from doing 20 years in Leavenworth. This time, though, he wasn't just nervous. He was sick with fear, ashen with it, like he'd just come from watching his twin get autopsied. I can't see you right now, Jane, he said, and started to shut the door on me. Then the door jerked open again, and this giant ape of a guy stepped up behind Ganesh and belly bumped him so hard he nearly fell on his face. Hi there, Jane, the ape said, grabbing Ganesh by the back of the neck to steady him. What brings you here? I kept my voice casual, just dropping by to say hi. Oh, yeah? He looked down at Ganesh, turning him like a can whose label he wanted to read. You sure about that? Because Ganesh here, he likes to sell things to people. He's not so good about paying bills, but he likes to sell. You sure you didn't come to do some shopping, Jane? No, really. I'm just here to say hi. But if you guys are busy... Yeah, we kind of are. He started dragging Ganesh back inside. So come back later. Much. I hadn't seen or heard from Ganesh since, and I naturally assumed the worst. I hadn't seen Julius Deed since, either. His lawyer had him cleaned up for the trial, but King Kong with a haircut is still King Kong, so I should have recognized him right off the bat. But I was so gung-ho to get in the jury, I spent my first half hour in the courtroom focused on the juror questionnaire. It wasn't until I got done bullshitting my way through that and handed it in that I noticed Deed staring at me, trying to work out where he knew me from. We both got it at the same time. Then he smiled like Christmas just came early, and all my good intentions went straight out the window. I started hoping three things in quick succession. One, that I didn't get picked for the jury after all. Two, that Deeds hadn't made bail. And three, that if he had made bail, Ganesh was either dead or out of the country because Ganesh knew where I lived. I'm going to guess that none of your hopes were realized. Of course they weren't. I'd done such a great job on the questionnaire that I was the first juror seated. Deeds looked really happy about that. And then later, after we were dismissed for the day and I'd snuck out of the courthouse, I saw him on the sidewalk shaking hands with his lawyer. So I tried calling Ganesh, but his phone had been disconnected. I didn't know whether that, was a good or, whether that was good or bad. I thought it might be a smart idea for me to skip town regardless. But first I made a stop at the house of this other dealer I knew to re-up my Valium stash. And it gets hazy after that, but I guess between the Valium and the bottle of vodka I kept in my freezer, I decided not to skip town. And there's one other important thing I haven't told you, and that's the date that all this happened. I got summoned to jury duty on Monday, September 10th, 2001. And so the next morning, I came to in my living room at around 6 a.m., and the TV was on. And at first, I thought it must be tuned to the Sci-Fi Channel because there was this image of the World Trade Center, and one of the buildings was on fire. Then I saw the CNN logo in the corner of the screen, and I'm like, hang on a minute. And it had just registered that this wasn't a bad movie. This was real when the second plane flew in. I turned up the sound and sat there for about an hour with my jaw hanging open. Then my phone rang. It was King Kong. Hi there, Jane. Instead of being freaked out like I should have been, like I was supposed to be, I actually felt sorry for the guy because the world had just turned upside down and he obviously hadn't gotten the memo yet. So I said, are you near a TV set? That wasn't the reaction he was looking for. Listen, you stupid bitch, he said. Do you know who this is? And I said, yeah, I know who it is. And I know, I th I know you think you're a badass, but the thing is, you've just been trumped. And he went off, all threats and swearing, but I didn't really hear it because it was right then that the first tower went down. A 110-story building, and it turned to rubble right in front of my eyes, and I realized in this weirdly detached way that I was witnessing a mass murder. On the phone, Deeds was raging. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? And I said, get fucked, killer, and hung up on him. There was a moment right after I set the phone down when I thought, that probably wasn't too smart. But then I looked back at the debris cloud on TV, and by the time the second tower collapsed, I put Julius Deeds completely out of my mind. I took some more Valium and went for a long walk. Around noon, I ended up at Coit Tower on Telegraph Hill. By then, all the planes had been grounded, and the city was quieter than I'd ever heard it. The only sounds were the wind and a few people crying. I was looking for a place to light up a joint when I saw Phil. We didn't say anything, just wandered off together and sat down to watch the day go by. It was after dark when I finally went home. 
The drugs had worn off enough for me to start worrying about deeds again, but by then I couldn't remember whether that early morning phone call had really happened or was just something I'd imagined. I was wary going into my building, but when I found my apartment door closed and locked, not kicked off its hinges, I figured I was safe. I let myself in. My TV was on, and that seemed wrong, but I told myself not to be paranoid. I started hunting around the living room for the remote, and then the television shut off on its own, and Deed said, Hello, Jane. He was sitting in the darkest corner of the room with a baseball bat across his knees. I looked at him, and the bat, and then at the door I'd just come in by, and he said, You won't make it. Okay, I said, standing very still. And he said, You were right about me being trumped. This morning when we talked, I had no idea. You know they say the body count could be as high as 5,000? 5,000. Yeah, kind of puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Still, it's not all bad news. My trial, for example, it's been postponed. Postponed? Yeah, the courthouse was closed today, and the way things are, my lawyer says it could be months before I get a new trial date. I'm happy for you, I said. Oh, it's not just good luck for me. It's lucky for you, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He stood up. You'll have time to recover. That's my last clear memory from that night. I know I did try for the door, and I eventually made it. I was bleeding out in the landing when the neighbors found me, but not before he worked me over. He broke my collarbone and my right arm in two places, and cracked or broke half my ribs. He also got in one really good shot to my skull. The doctors told me later it was a miracle I didn't end up dead or a vegetable from that. I was in a coma for ten days. I woke up in a darkened hospital room with a television playing somewhere nearby. Tom Cruise was talking about a priest who died giving last rites to a fireman at Ground Zero. Then Mariah Carey started singing that we all have a hero inside us, and I thought maybe I'd died and this was hell. But the show went on, with more celebrities coming out to sing and tell stories, and there were calls for donations, and eventually I realized I wasn't in hell, I was just in America. The cops came around. I told them I didn't know who'd attack me. Then Phil came to see me, and I told him the same thing, but he knew I was lying. I told him to mind his own business. I had another visitor, too. I first noticed him about a week after I woke up, and for a long while I wasn't sure he was real. I was in a lot of pain, but because of the coma, the doctors were nervous about drugging me. But I kept after them, and eventually they put me on a morphine drip, and I was floating on that when this guy showed up. He was black, with a round face. He sat in a chair over by the window, watching me. What made you think he wasn't real? The way he was dressed. He had on this cheerleader's uniform. Pink check skirt, pink sweater with OMF across the chest, pink pom-poms, plus this wig, a yarn wig, like a pink mop head with pigtails. That does sound a little strange. On the other hand, San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, I thought of that too, but the other thing about this guy, nobody else seemed to be able to see him. The woman I shared the room with had end-stage brain cancer, so she was out of it. But there were nurses and doctors coming through all the time, and they never so much as glanced at him. I tried to draw attention to him without, you know, actually saying anything. If it turned out he wasn't real, I didn't want my morphine drip pulled, but no dice. So finally I gave in and tried talking to him. What do you want? What's the magic phrase, he said. What? What's the magic phrase? He lowered his pom-poms and puffed his chest out. Omnis mundum facimus, I said. That's it. Now look under your pillow. It took some major maneuvering, but eventually I slipped my good arm under the pillow. My hand closed around a coin, the coin. I was more relieved than I could say, but I was also pissed off. Now you show up? Where the hell were you when that asshole was beating the shit out of me? That was an oversight, he said, frowning. Not my department, you understand, but I am sorry. It was a busy day and details got missed. He brightened again and laughed. Get fucked, killer. I like that. That showed spirit. Not a lot of brains, but spirit. So why now? Well, I know you got hit in the head, but you are aware of recent events, right? The organization I represent, that that coin represents, is, is holding a recruitment drive. You want me to help fight terrorists? No. There's people all over the country lining up to do that. Well, what then? Well, the thing about one big evil taking center stage, it tends to draw attention away from all the other evils. So now somebody's got to swim against the tide to make sure those other evils don't flourish from neglect. You could be a part of that if you're interested. But why now, I persisted. Those other evils, they were always there. <laughs> Yep. Hello. Um, those other evils, they were always there. So why didn't you come for me sooner? Omnis mundum facimus, he said. You looked up the translation for that, right? You know it doesn't mean wait for further instructions or stand around with your thumb up your ass. 
No, but let me lay another saying on you. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now the implication is that, few, that the few are special, brave enough to answer the call or worthy enough to be chosen. But there's another way of looking at it. If many are called and few are chosen, maybe that's because most of the many have better things to do. He shook a pom-pom at me accusingly. You had a life. It was hoped you'd do something with it. Great, I said. So you're telling me you're the booby prize? He laughed again. I do like that spirit. I, we, can use that spirit. So the question becomes, are you willing to let it be used? Are you ready to be one of the few? You know I am. All right, then. Tomorrow night, between 7 and 7.15, you're to go to the top floor of this building. Turn left out the elevator and look for a door marked Examination 1. If you come early or show up late, it'll be just an empty room. But if you come on time, you'll meet a man named Robert True who'll tell you what the next step is. That was all he had to say to me, but still he sat there, watching me and smiling. Go ahead, he finally said. Ask it. Okay. Why are you dressed like a cheerleader? You know what a non-disclosure agreement is, Jane? This outfit serves the same purpose. What do you suppose would happen if he told the hospital staff about our conversation? They'd cut off my drugs. You got it, he said, and winked. A few moments later, a nurse came in and gave me a shot. I fell asleep, and when I woke up again, my visitor was gone. But the coin was still there, safe under my pillow. The next evening, I made sure I was awake. At quarter to seven, I hauled myself out of bed and wheeled my IV stand to the elevator. I went up to the 14th floor and found examination one, and at 7.01, I knocked. Come in, a voice said. Inside, the room was a lot like this one. Spare, I mean, with just a table and a couple of chairs. Robert True was standing when I came in. He was wearing a gray flannel suit that might have been stylish back when Ozzie and Harriet was a hit TV show. He was short and heavy and didn't have much hair. Welcome, Jane, he greeted me. I'm Bob True. Hi, I said. Omnis mundum facimus. That's all right. I don't need the magic phrase. But as long as we're on the subject, have you worked it out yet? I had, finally. It's a comeback, I told him, to that thing people say when they don't want to be blamed for a bad situation. I didn't make the world. I only live in it. Very good. So that's what you're about, your organization, making the world a better place? By fighting evil in all its forms, True said, nodding. Are you the government? He seemed surprised by the question. Does the government fight evil? I thought about it. For some reason, the first thing that came to mind wasn't the FBI or the justice system, but my last trip to the DMV. Well, I said, it can. Lots of things can fight evil, True replied. Cinder blocks, for example. If a cinder block had fallen in Joseph Stalin's crib, the 20th century might have been a bit more pleasant. Even if one had, though, I doubt most people would say that the purpose of cinder blocks is to fight evil. So you're not the government. What are you then? Vigilantes? You hunt bad guys, right? The organization pursues its goal through diverse means, most of them constructive. We employ good Samaritans, random acts of kindness, second and third chances. He went on, ticking off more than a dozen of what I eventually understood were division names, actual organization departments that fought evil in positive, life-affirming ways. My eyes must have glazed over because suddenly he stopped and said, am I boring you? A little, I admitted. So which are you, a good Samaritan or a random actor? I work for what's known as the cost benefits division. You handle the money. I help allocate the organization's resources, which are substantial but still finite. Resources includes people? Of course. Well then, if you know anything about people, you know I'm not a good Samaritan. No, True said, I don't suppose you are. He placed a green NC gun in the center of the table. You'll recognize this. The one I had last time was orange. The one you had in Siesta Corda was standard issue. This is a special model. What's special about it? We'll get to that. First, I have a hypothetical question for you, a test question. OK. There are two men, both evil. One is a former concentration camp commandant responsible for the murder of a half million people. He's 90 years old, living in hiding in the South American jungle. The other man is much younger, barely 25, in excellent health, and living openly in the middle of San Francisco. He's only killed once so far, but he's discovered he has a talent and a taste for it, and it's likely he'll kill again many times. Though, of course, the total number of his victims will never be more than a fraction of the commandant's. The death of either of these men would leave the world a better place. You have the power to kill one of them, but only one. Whom do you choose? That's easy, I said. The young guy. Why? Because killing the Nazi is the obvious choice, and this is a trick question. Clever, True said, in a tone that suggested it was anything but. Now, how about a less glib answer? In this hypothetical situation, I'm supposed to be you? Someone with my job description, let's say. Then the answer's the same. Kill the young guy. Why? 
His worst days are still ahead of him. With the Nazi, the Holocaust is already out of the barn. Killing him might be more satisfying, but the net benefit is smaller. What about deterrence, True said. Wouldn't killing the Nazi discourage other people from following in his footsteps? It might, if it were a public execution. If I were the government, I could put him on trial for genocide and then hang him on pay-per-view. That might turn some heads. Trouble is, I'm not the government. I'm a member of a secret organization that dresses its agents like cheerleaders so people can't talk about them. An execution that no one knows about won't deter squat. What about justice? Is this a hypothetical real situation or a hypothetical comic book? And what about vengeance? It's fun, but it doesn't have anything to do with fighting evil. No, True agreed, it doesn't. Does that mean I pass the test? The first half. The second half is less theoretical. He laid a couple booklets on the table. They look like those question booklets you get when you take the SATs. A name was written on the cover of each one in felt-tip pen. The one in the first booklet was Benjamin Loomis. The one in the second was Julius Deeds. Two men, True said, both evil. One you've already met. Yeah, I have, I said, and he's not 90 years old, if that's where you're going with this. Julius Deeds has been indicted for murder. The case against him is strong, and despite his efforts at jury tampering, he'll probably be convicted. Even if he avoids prison, his actions have made him enemies on both sides of the law. A 90-year-old might well outlive him. And Loomis? Let me guess. He's barely 25, in excellent health. 27, actually. And he's killed four times, not just once. Other than that, yes, he's just like the younger man in the hypothetical. A predator. He's been operating on a three-month cycle, so unless someone stops him, we expect he'll take his next victim in early December. The police don't have a clue who he is. The police aren't even aware of his crimes yet. He hunts male prostitutes, men who've been abandoned by their families and have no one to report them missing. He kills discreetly and buries the bodies. In time, he'll be found out, of course. They almost always are, but it could be years from now. I stared at the tabletop. The gun's a one-shot, isn't it? That's the special modification. And the test is I have to choose. We need to know what your real priorities are, True said. In a moment, you'll select one of these booklets. Inside, you'll find all the information you need to complete your first assignment. The other booklet will go back into our files with a notation that its subject is never to be harmed or otherwise acted against by any agent of the organization. So if I pick deeds, Loomis gets a free pass? You'd really do that? It wouldn't be much of a test otherwise. He looked at his wristwatch. You have one minute to decide. Screw that. I don't need a minute. I reached for a booklet. True took the other one. Don't lose the gun, he said. You'll see me again when the job is completed. I was in the hospital for a few more weeks. Towards the end of my stay, even though I hadn't said a word about the organization, the doctors downgraded me from morphine to Vicodin. This made me cranky. They released me right before Thanksgiving. I had a quiet holiday at home, just fill, a couple microwave turkey dinners, and some non-prescription painkillers. And then, on the last day of November, I killed Julius Deeds. It happened like this. Deeds' favorite hangout was a nightclub in the Mission District. He'd show up most nights around 10, driving a red Mustang convertible that he'd park asshole fashion in front of a hydrant, or just facing the wrong direction. Like to say, you know, I'm the king of the jungle, the normal rules don't apply to me. If it wasn't raining, he'd leave the top down, too. I figured the deal with that was he wanted to show what a tough guy he was, so tough that nobody would dare steal his car. Or maybe he hoped someone would steal it, so he'd have an excuse to get in some batting practice. That night, I was hiding in an alley across the street from the club when he drove up. I watched him go inside and gave him half an hour to get comfortable. Then I set his Mustang on fire. Gasoline would have been poetic, but besides being really conspicuous, a gas can is tough to sling one-handed, and my right arm was still in a cast. I used charcoal starter instead, a 20-ounce container small enough to slip inside my jacket. I strolled up to the car during a lull in the street traffic and stood there casually, peeing lighter fluid over the front seat upholstery. When the container was empty, I took out a Strike Anywhere match and lit it off my cast. The Mustang's interior was burning nicely by the time the nightclub's bouncer raised the alarm. People started coming out of the club. Most of them hung back, but one particular Cro-Magnon went charging at the car. For a second, it looked like Deeds was going to do my job for me by diving headfirst into the fire. Where were you at this point? A couple blocks up the street, by the entrance to this park. It was on a rise, so I had a clear line of sight to the nightclub, and vice versa. I was standing under a street lamp, spotlit. You wanted Deeds to see you? That was the plan. It took a while, though. You know that expression, a blind rage? I know what that means now. Deeds was still trying to decide whether to throw himself on the flames when the bouncer came up with a fire extinguisher. The guy was trying to help, right? But as soon as he started spraying foam onto the Mustang, Deeds went berserk and swung on him. The guy went down, and then Deeds grabbed the fire extinguisher himself and spent about a minute trying to figure out how to work it. 
Then he went berserk again and tossed the extinguisher through a shop window. In the middle of this tantrum, he suddenly stiffened up, and I knew he'd finally sensed me watching him. Over here, killer, I whispered. He turned slowly in place until he was looking straight at me. I raised my good arm and gave a little wave. Then I ran like hell into the park. About a hundred yards in, I stopped to look back. Deeds had already reached the park entrance and was ripping a two-by-four off a sign on the park gate. I ran on, my cast banging against my ribs. When I looked back again, Deeds had closed about half the distance between us and was swinging the two-by-four in big warm-up circles. I made a last dash downhill past a swing set and out the far side of the park, onto a street lined with houses. I went to a house near the end of the block, pulling out a key as I ran up the front steps. Deeds was right on my heels now. I'd barely got the door shut behind me when the pounding started. The lock splintered on the third blow and gave way on the fourth. The door chain snapped and then Deeds was inside. This time I was the one sitting in a dark corner of the living room. Instead of a baseball bat, I was holding a double-barreled shotgun. I had it up and ready with both hammers cocked, the barrels balanced on my right wrist, my left hand on the triggers. You're a dead woman, Deeds announced. Then he blinked, noticing the gun, and added, You're kidding me, right? No, I said, I'm not kidding. Now here's what's going to happen. You're going to drop that piece of wood you're holding, and we're going to go downstairs to the basement. No, Deeds snarled. What's going to happen is you're going to give me that fucking gun. You can either hand it over easy or I can take it from you. But if you make me take it, I'm really going to be angry. I pulled the left side trigger. The shot struck Deeds in the arm, knocking him back and tearing a big chunk out of his bicep. He grunted and dropped the two by four. I'll tell you what, I said. You want to start worrying about my feelings. Deeds kept a hand to his ruined bicep. You shot me, he complained. You're crazy. He glanced over his shoulder at the broken front door. You won't make it, I said. I stood up and gestured towards the back of the house. Basement door's that way. Start walking. He moved slowly, hoping I'd come up too close behind and give him a chance to grab at the gun. When we reached the basement stairs, he slowed down even more and tried goading me. I don't know how you think you're going to come out on top here, Jane. I mean, I know you're not going to kill me. Keep moving. I know you're not going to kill me. Maybe you've got the guts to pull the trigger. I'll grant you that much. But you don't want to go to prison, do you? Keep moving. Or are you stupid enough to think you can claim self-defense on this? Is that the plan? Tell the cops you had to do it because of that beating I gave you? You think they're going to care about that? I wasn't going to argue with him, but I couldn't help myself. I think they'll care about those three kids you burned to death. Those kids. So that's what this is about? He laughed. Let me tell you something about those kids, Jane. I didn't even know they were in the house that night. But their mother, my so-called girlfriend, she knew. And I'll bet the selfish bitch didn't look back once when she was running to save herself. You want to pass judgment on someone, Jane? What about a mom who leaves her own kids to fry? Shut up and keep moving. I'm not going to say it again. All right, all right. But I'm telling you, Jane, I really don't see this ending well for you. I don't. He trailed off in mid-threat. We'd finally reached the bottom of the stairs. The basement was lit by strings of hanging bulbs. Its floor had originally been wood, but the planks had been pried up and set aside, exposing bare dirt beneath. Here and there, four places in all, long, narrow holes had been dug in the dirt, filled in again, and sprinkled with lime. In between the water heater and the furnace, a fifth hole had been started, but it was only half finished. The handle of a shovel jutted out of it at an angle. Lying face down in front of it, one hand still reaching for the shovel, was the figure of a man. What the hell is this, Deed said. The greater of two evils, I told him. His name was Benjamin Loomis. He was a serial killer. Earlier tonight he had a heart attack, died in the act, at least that's what the cops will think. Died in the act of what? Burying his last victim. Deeds turned around and lunged for the gun then, but my finger was already tightening on the trigger. Bad monkey, I said. After, I went back into the park and found True sitting on a bench near the swings. He wasn't happy. I told you to choose one, he said. One booklet, I reminded him. But I didn't need your help to track Deeds down. He was in the damn phone book. And then when I went to take care of Loomis and found that shotgun in his closet, well, I figured it was part of the test to see if I had the initiative to take out both of them. <laughs> did you really think that? Or did you kill Deeds because you wanted to? I shrugged. Does it even matter? You said it yourself. They were both evil. The world's better off. Yes, but now there are discrepancies for the police to wonder about, such as the fact that Loomis died several hours before Deeds. They won't be able to tell that, I bet. I mean, yeah, if they came right now while Deeds is still warm, but I don't hear any sirens, do you? And once his body hits room temperature, it'll be a lot harder to fix the time of death. That basement was cold as a meat locker. 
And when they discovered that Loomis's other victims were poisoned, not shot, so? Maybe Deeds wasn't a normal victim. Maybe he found out what Loomis was doing and tried to blackmail him or just walked in on him somehow. Somehow. It's a nod problem. The police will believe that Loomis killed Deeds because it's the simplest explanation. They'll want to believe it, especially when they find out who Deeds was. Tell me I'm wrong. True shook his head. This is not how we do things. Look, you said you wanted to know what my priorities were. You want to give me grief for bending the rules? You want to blackball me for it? Fine, but we all make the world, right? And if that's true, I'm not going to settle for just one bad guy when I can get two. I saw my chance and went for it, and I'm not sorry. I'd do it again. I stopped there, worried about overplaying it. But after a minute had gone by and True hadn't given me the chop, I went on in a softer voice. So do I pass the test? Am I in? Another minute. True, true sighed. You're in. So, um, so that's sort of how she gets into the organization. And then the uh, sort of book goes on from there and just sort of describes her career and how it all goes wrong in the end. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Did we startle them by shushing them in the middle of the reading? Turn your microphone back on. Force them to ask the first question. Yes? Now they can't. Now their microphone is off. Ask a question in Mountain View? Boulder. 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 No. No. I think they can see us but not hear us or they can hear us. Okay. That's true. They would have left by now. I'm really good at lip reading in Boulder. Um, I have I have a question. Yes, you do. The fact that your successive books are quite different from one another. How do you end up drifting into one type of book or another? I am first of all horribly horribly impractical from a marketing standpoint. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's like I, because I always wanted to write and just always felt like that was meant to do, I, I never really considered the, the sort of the smarter marketing aspects of it. So I've just always tended to write whatever interest, you know, whatever story I felt like writing without considering how hard it is for a poor publicist to, to try and sell your next book when it has nothing at all to do with what your last one was like. Um, so yeah, I just sort of, more by accident than anything else, sort of wandered into a different genre each time. My first book was a, sort of a, a fantasy novel set at, at Cornell University, and then second was, was a science fiction satire, and then my last novel before this was about a, a, a it was mostly a mainstream novel, but about a friendship between two people with multiple personality disorder. And um, in this one, they're sort of billing as a psychological mystery thriller. Um, and my next book will probably be uh, alternate history. So, um, and it, I didn't plan to do something different each time. It's just my interests are sort of all over the place, and in, in part because it's more fun to do something different, I guess. So, although now that interviewers have started pointing this out, there's a part of me that's going like, how long can I keep this up? <laughs> um, it's interesting to contrast with Neil yesterday saying he felt he had to bail out of the of the uh, historical fiction because otherwise he'd get sucked into past the event horizon and never come out. So hmm. There was sort of an, an attractor nature there where he started building up the research materials and getting into that, and then it's much easier to continue. But he may also have a more obsessive nature in that way. Oh, I think Neil and I are both obsessive in our own ways, but um, I would just think after the Baroque cycle, you'd want to definitely do something different just because it's. <laughs> I'm still amazed that he managed to write that in a lifetime. Because I'm, you know, this is like two, three years, and it's. <laughs> Um, well, let me, I could probably say a little bit of just about how I came up with this. Um, it actually, I, I have this weird habit of coming up with titles first. Um, it happened with Sewer, Gas, and Electric, my second novel, and then again with this. This actually started out, um, I thank Trey Parker and Matt Stone and the acknowledgments because I um, was watching the third season of South Park and there's, I think it was the premiere episode of the season where the kids go to the Costa Rican rainforest and get lost. And 
At one point, Cartman is hitting a monkey with a stick, screaming, you know, bad monkey. <laughs> and most people probably either laughed at that or were horrified and then moved on. And I just started thinking, geez, that'd be an interesting title for a novel. <laughs> <laughs> what would it be about? Um, and not long after, I was reading um, David Simon's nonfiction book, Homicide, which is basically his account of spending a year with the Baltimore Homicide Division, which was eventually the basis for the the uh, Barry Levinson TV show. And I started thinking about writing a police procedural called Bad Monkeys in which the, well, there was one version that was sort of a realistic police procedural, and, and Bad Monkeys was a slang term for particularly horrible uh, criminals or a particularly horrible perpetrator of a particularly gruesome series of crimes. And then came up with this other idea where it was a science fictional uh, cop drama and Bad Monkeys was the name of a police division that dealt with crimes specifically committed by human beings as opposed to the Bad Martians Bureau, which handled the extraterrestrial crimes, and then the, the Bad Robots Division, which was the, they did the, the evil AIs and, and you know, fraud, fraud committing robots and stuff like that. And um, I love the nickname idea, but, but the idea of a science fiction cop drama just eventually left me really cold. And, <laughs> then I gave it sort of a half twist and I said, well, what if it's not a futuristic police bureau? What if it's like a secret organization? And I can keep the funky nicknames. And, and then I thought, well, and what if it's a possible psychotic or schizophrenic delusion? And um, from there I get to this protagonist sitting in a, a cell talking to a psychiatrist. And at that point my protagonist was, you know, sort of just the unreliable narrator. And I didn't know whether it was going to be a man or a woman, but because it was starting to sound like a Philip K. Dick novel, I, I toyed with the idea of naming him Phil. Um, and then I was reading another book, a, a biography of Philip K. Dick, and I found out that he had a twin sister named Jane Charlotte who died in infancy. And never heard of this, but um, apparently he was really haunted by her death. And in his childhood, he made up you know, uh, imaginary playmates to sort of substitute for her. And then in his books, there are references to Jane everywhere, apparently. So like in A Scanner Darkly, a DJ comes on and dedicates a song to Phil and Jane. Um, so I thought, well, geez, what if Jane Charlotte is my protagonist? And then she's got this brother named Phil who, as the story progresses, you start to wonder, is Phil like there or is he an imaginary playmate? Um, and that was sort of how I eventually came to this. So, um, And once I got inside Jane's head and started writing her voice, it was just like, yes, this is fun. So, and um, it starts off like almost, you know, believable, and then as it goes along, it gets progressively weirder, and it was just sort of fun coming up with, the, the way the organization keeps itself secret is by running its affairs along the lines of a psychotic delusion so that if you try and tell anybody, you, you will get funny looks or, you know, put away, so. For example, their surveillance bureau is called Panopticon, and they have a, a special program called Eyes Only that uses these really, really small sensor devices that you can't, they're so small you can't see them, and they, it's called Eyes Only because they only put them on physical representations of eyes. So anytime you see a photograph or a statue or any picture of an eye that's not an actual person's head, there's a chance it might be watching you. Um, and you know the, the the actual name of Panopticon, I think it's it's the Department of Ubiquitous Intermittent Surveillance, which basically means that they aren't always watching, but they always could be. And eyes only sort of encapsulates that. That so, and and when you start thinking about it, it's not just like photographs in in newspapers and stuff, but ID badges, currency. That like there are eyes all over the place, or the cover of the book. And um, so, so basically the cut. You want to create an impression in the reader that they don't know if she, they want to really believe her or if she's making some of this up? Or... Well, the whole, yeah, the whole thing is that she's, she's killed somebody and she admits that she's done it, um, but then she starts telling the cops this story about working for this organization. And the guy she killed is not on the official hit list, which is why she was allowed to get caught, basically. Um, and the story is, yes, is she nuts? You know, is she pretending to be nuts in order to get away with murder? Um, or is there another explanation? And um, so that's sort of the game that it plays. And, and it, it, again, gets progressively weirder as you go along. And it's one of these stories that every time you think you get to the bottom of it, 
Jane hauls out another, another thing that you haven't heard yet. She's the kind of person who, if you catch her in a contradiction, she just shrugs it off and, and takes it in stride and adds it into her story in a way that, well, yeah, you think that that didn't make sense, but actually it does. And here's a whole new episode for me to tell you about that will explain why. So that's like The explanations just go on forever. Yeah. Really Although this one actually does come to an end. And I mean, when it's over, you do know what, what really happened. But, um, but yes, it, it takes a while to get to the bottom of it. Um, I had a question. Is all your stuff so dark? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. Um, I mean, it really, it, I, I don't shy away from like really awful things happening to people, but, you know, I can. I can write about stuff like genocide without ruining your whole day, too. I, I like to think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there are probably dark moments in all my novels, but I actually, I actually find them rather cheerful, ultimately, or rather as, as cheerful as you can be while not totally ignoring things like 9 11. And, um, the one on the hill doesn't seem to have been all that dark. Particularly. That's probably the cheeriest of them, my first novel, so. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's sort of. It was funny, like my last novel I thought was really hopeful, but, but I think for a lot of people you, you, you talk about multiple personality and sort of immediately think child abuse and they think, geez, I, I don't know if I want to go there. Um, but the book is really more about this guy, you know, it's, it's about people learning how to live their lives and, and sort of cope with, like the, the characters are, the main character in Set This House in Order, that what makes him interesting is that he's, he's not looking to be reintegrated into a single personality, but he's come up with this system for, for sort of having his different people coexist. So he's got this imaginary house in his head where all of his different alters can sort of see and talk to each other and they have a table kind of like this one where they can sit around and have meetings and they have like a strict assignment of you know who gets to come out and, and have the body when and you've got to follow the rules or you don't get your out time. And um, So it's less a novel about the horrible things that happened that made him who he is and more about Getting everything in, in in order so that he can go on and, and live his life like a you know a productive member of society. So I mean he has to go back and deal with some unresolved issues, but it's it's less about that than about also sort of just this interesting way of living as as a multiplicity rather than than you know the way most of us do. So, um, but yes, there are dark moments in all of the books. So. writing is just pure fun and messing around, and how much of it is, is work? I, I gotta glue myself to this chair because I gotta get... That's, that that's the work part, is, is just getting myself to sit down and actually start putting it on the page. I mean, the thinking, thinking it up is a lot of fun, and I do a lot of... I mean, even when I'm not sitting, I'm sort of writing, because anytime I'm alone in a room for more than five minutes, I start talking to myself or doing dialogue or just imagining scenes from stuff and I liked it. One of the great things about living in Seattle as opposed to Philadelphia where we used to live is you can go for really long hikes here and you know, just go out for 10 miles and, and just be thinking about stuff. And so for me the only hard part is the actual initial sitting down and setting it down on paper or, or on hard drive. Um, but even that once they get rolling is a lot of fun. So, um, But yeah, I just my work ethic is a little... <laughs> I do it on computer, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't imagine the longhand. I would cramp up after the first paragraph, I think. Um, you know, and I mean, I, my mother was a, yeah, my mother was a, a, a translator and a secretary, and, and so we had, like, an IBM Selectrix at home from a very early age, which, you know, I, doesn't mean anything now, but at the time, that was like, before computers, that was like having being the first kid on your block with a computer. It was like the perfect typewriter with different fonts and everything. It was like great. <laughs> um, so I learned to type very early on. I was never much of a handwriting guy. And then moving to word processing, once they got past that whole early awkward stage where where hard drives would fail all the time or where floppy drives didn't work, once they came up with the idea that you know it would be great if a floppy drive had a rigid carapace so you couldn't bend it really easily. Um, then I, I had no problem switching to that, and yeah, I don't think I'd go back. Hmm. So what else can I tell you? I forget how to form this into kind of a question.
question. Um, <laughs> well, it's uh, sewer gas and electric, electrical is kind of an interesting book, kind of for me personally. Um, and then it, I actually, it was the first book that I ever bought purely because Amazon said, you should buy this. <laughs> it was new. I'm like, really? Um, which has built this whole weird relationship with me and Amazon, kind of based on the results of this. Like, you're right, I should have bought this. I'm glad I did, but... How did you know? How did you do that? <laughs> uh, just kind of curious, you know, kind of just based on how uh, different your books are, kind of... That is a... require readers? <laughs> with difficulty, it's, it's yeah, I, I think it's almost with each book, and also because, because it, particularly with the earlier ones, I took so much time in between them. Um, it, it was... With each book, I've picked up sort of a mini cult following, and then people who were, were interested will come back, and some of them will be really disappointed. It's not more of the same. Um, so the hardcore fans are the ones who just like the, Matt, the, the ineffable Matt Ruff quality that pervades all of them, <laughs> despite the fact that they're all over the map in terms of genre. Um, but mostly it's just been, you know, it's been word of mouth, and I've been lucky, too, in that, um, yeah, Super Gas and Electric, I, I actually finished probably in 95 or something like that, and it, the publication was delayed a couple of years because my editor had become a publisher and bought the publishing house, and this rather filled up his time. So, um, But that meant that the book was delayed until the point when the Internet was really starting to catch on, and then Amazon, I, I, somebody, somebody at Amazon, I think was Craig, Craig Angler, Angler, yeah, um, was an early supporter of the book and really chatted it up, and that... That helped a lot, get the word out that, oh, yes, there's finally another Matt Ruff novel. So there was this spike in sales, and then that showed up on sort of the Ingram watch list, and there, were, there was a science fiction editor named Betsy Mitchell who said, you know, there's this Matt Ruff at the number seven spot this week, and I've never heard of him, and why is that? And so that led probably directly to the, the mass market paperback sale with Warner, which got me a lot more readers there. And then... Um, and then the last novel, it's, it's again, I, you know, I took enough time getting it done that it, it was just a matter of letting people know that there was another Matt Ruff novel. And then I was lucky with critical success on that one, winning a couple of awards and the James Tiptree Award and, and um, getting some good reviews. And now this book has come soon enough that there were still people waiting. So, But yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the things I should worry about more and haven't, and that's, that's part of what Lisa's for, <laughs> to worry about the more practical aspects of the... If this book sells really well, will you feel some temptation to try to carry over that piece of You know, it's... Not even just in a mercenary way. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, do, I do, yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit, but I, again, it's like I, I can't... It's, it's one of those things, in order to get a book done, it's really got to be something I really want to write. So unless I had an idea for something that was really close, in which case it wouldn't matter to me that it was. But um, uh, I, I've certainly, it, you know, it, it impacts your thinking. But, you know, um, I think I'm probably just going to keep doing what I've been doing because so far it seems to have served me pretty well. So um, what we're sort of hoping, though, with this is that, that it will have a life either as a, as a movie or a TV series, because that allows you to do more things with the, same, with the same characters and ideas, and I don't actually have to write another novel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could still have some creative input on that without necessarily um, writing a whole other book. Um, but, yeah, so... The thing is, I tend to write books in a way that, that you couldn't really do sequels for most of my novels unless, you know, because I tend to, I tend to tie things up in a way, either the, either the idea is so odd that it's got to be a one-off, or I wrap things up in the end in a way that it, you kind of can't keep going. So, um, and again, that's not something I do deliberately. It's just sort of the way I work. I like to tie up loose ends, so. Can I ask what you're, what you're reading and what you, what you enjoy reading for, your, for yourself? Yeah, I um, God, what am I reading right now? Um, just just was just rereading an Elmore Leonard novel. It's called Freaky Deaky, and the reason I always end up picking it up is for the very first chapter, which is drug dealer gets a call at his house from his girlfriend, and she keeps asking, him, "Are you sitting down? Are you sitting down?" And finally, he sits down in this big chair that's right next to the phone. She knew he would answer, and when she sit, he announces he's sitting down, she tells him, "Well, there's dynamite in the chair, and if you get up, you're going to die." This is the greatest opening chapter. 
Um, and he, he becomes impatient, of course, and doesn't make it out of the chair. But um, um, and other than that, I've been um, uh, reading um, John Crowley is a big favorite of mine. Um, I'm waiting for Neil Stevenson's next book very anxiously. Um, um, Richard Price, uh, God, who else? There's a guy named Wilton Barnhart who I hope will write another novel someday. Um, he, Wilton Barnhart wrote a novel called, he's, he's probably best known for his first novel, it's called Emma Who Saved My Life, which is sort of a great coming of age story. He's another guy who writes a different book every time. His second novel, though, which is my favorite, is called Gospel. And it, if you can kind of imagine if the Da Vinci Code were really good, <laughs> you know, it, this is what it would be. And it's, it's a 70 year old professor, uh, a a Holocaust survivor a rabbi from Jerusalem and this this 28 year old grad student racing around Europe trying to find a lost gospel text while various people are trying to stop them and it's it's just a really really cool story um, and um, hmm, what else I always get asked this question and I always blank out when people ask me but um, uh, Oh, and I picked up a, I'm still not sure whether I like it or not, but there's a, there's a book called the A Corpse in the Koryu, which is a uh, detective novel set in North Korea, which, yeah, that's why I had to buy it. <laughs> um, and, and it's, it's, I didn't, you know, it's like this police inspector who gets dragged into some sort of pissing match between two, two factions of the North Korean government. And just for the setting alone, I had to read it. And the problem is, I, I realize as I'm reading it, I have no way to tell how realistic it is because I have no baseline. Um, and I was just really stunned because the guy is basically being really, really rude to his superiors, which I've, I've never heard of people being in a totalitarian society. But apparently, yeah. So it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what's on my list right now. Um, do, you end up, do you read much nonfiction? You end up reading mostly fiction. I tend to gravitate more to novels, but I do, you know, when, when a nonfiction subject strikes my fancy, I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, yeah, I have another North Korea book, which is, which is basically this, I, I can't remember the exact title, but it's, yeah, it's a guy who spent a lot of time over there. It's basically like the whole history of Kim Il-sung and, and, or, or Kim Il-jong. Um, and, um, uh, I like I like books with uh, sort of weird factoids. So William Poundstone is a guy who writes a lot of interesting bits and pieces, um, st things that have stories or, or hooks that I can sort of borrow and, and throw out in my own fiction. So. Um, I like to I like to know enough about a subject <coughs> so that I, I can know when I'm fabricating. Um, so this is one of the things that, yeah, because one of the things I, you know, it, like in this book, for example, and when I was doing the final edit, I hit a point where I basically fixed all the obvious problems and my brain was just sort of ransacking, looking for things to worry about. And there's a scene where Jane goes into the San Francisco panhandle and sits under a statue. And for some reason, probably because it was like, late in the evening in a day when I'd been thinking about the book all day, I got really worried that I'd never checked whether there was actually a statue in the San Francisco Panhandle, which in hindsight is obviously clearly an absurd thing to worry about, but I was just in this, this mental state where it was like, it's okay if I invented a statue, but I needed to know that I was making it up. I couldn't just, you know, have a statue that wasn't there because, you know, I forgot to check. And so, so actually, yeah, exactly. So I ended up going on Google Earth and looking at the satellite photos, <laughs> trying to find, you know, is there a statue of the right size? And um, Street View available at the time? No. no, no, no. And the resolution wasn't quite good enough. So I, you know, it's like there was there was one statue-shaped object, clearly statue, but it was it looked a little too large. And and Lisa's like, you know, trying to talk me down, and she's basically saying, Matt, it, you know, there's a statue. You can rest now. No, it's that's a big statue. I was thinking of a, I was thinking of a little anonymous statue. And 
you get used to this. Like yeah. You're mad and you, you know there are times when, yes, it, you try to logic him down, and then there are other times when you just, you know. But there's a point where I, yeah. I th that was sort of the point where I realized, yes, I read criti Critical Absurdity Mass, and it was just time to let it go. It's like, if I'm worrying about this, I fixed all the things that can be fixed, and, and it's time to let it go. So, um, but yeah, more generally, yeah, I just I just like to research enough to have an idea of of you know what I'm doing. So with set this house in order, I I read a lot of biographies of multiples, and I read a few nonfiction works, and basically I figured out that. It's a controversial enough subject that there are no real experts, and and I could I had a lot of latitude in sort of making things up, especially since again it was it was sort of a first person narrative, so I could always blame the unreliable narrator if I if I did something really odd, and it was just a matter of making it believable, even if if a, somebody would take issue with with the accuracy. So, um, but that's sort of how I do it. No, actually. Um, you know, the first two were, were third person, and then um, and actually set this house as a mixture. It's, it's one multiple tells everything in first person, past tense, because he's the one who's got the more coherent worldview, and he's able to look back reflectively. And then the, the second multiple is the woman he meets who doesn't even realize she's multiple at the beginning of the story. Her story is in third person, present tense, because um, that's how she sort of lives her life, is just trapped in a moment. And um, until she sort of starts building a house of her own, that's, that's sort of... So you, what you realize eventually is that her side of the story, she's, you're actually reading dispatches of one of her alters whose job it is to keep track of everything that happens. Um, um, and then the earlier books, yeah, are third person. And then this one's mostly first. But no, it's not, they're not all unreliable. It's just, but that's a, that's a useful, useful thing to get into for certain, certain things, and it can be fun. Matt's kind of a, a black box in a lot of ways. But I, I know when he's... Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I know when he's percolating ideas. We have conversations, everything over the breakfast table or in our lives, about stuff. And there's this point where it's almost like you can tell the little mental post-it notes just, you know, flagged. And it's like, oh, I'll file that away for future reference. That, you know, you never know what we're talking about or reading in the newspapers or whatever may... may work its way through and end up in one of his books, but he, he, you know, I'll always, he goes through a very long gestation period where he's thinking, talking to himself, reading, thinking, and then he, when he goes into his room to actually start to write, that's sort of an extended period of time, and he doesn't show me anything until he's reached a certain point, like maybe it'll be the first six chapters, it'll be the first half of the book, like, and he polishes continually as he goes along, you know, writing and rewriting. So he doesn't go through like 27 drafts that are markedly different. It's like when he hands you something, it's like it's so close to the final version, you know, he's there. So he doesn't share anything until he's reached that point where he's happy with it. This is where he wants to go. And sometimes, you know, he'll give it to me and then ask me what I think or ask me qu specific questions if there's something that's bothering him or just hear what my reaction is. And, um, you know, with with this book, he didn't show it to me until he was almost done, and he gave me everything except the last chapter, yeah. 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 <laughs> which he didn't tell me he had done that. And I'm reading, and I'm reading, and I'm reading, and, I, and, it, and then it was like let out this scream when you're like sort of stopping in the middle and not knowing what's That's going right. on. I and that. then I said, you have to tell me what happens. He said, no, I can't do that. I gotta finish <laughs> writing it, and then I don't want to spoil the surprise for you. And and. Uh, and then when he did finally give me the final chapter, <coughs> he had to leave the house while I read it. He didn't want to be there when I was reading it. And then he came back, and I had like just finished it, and I was so floored. I just, I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You know? And I, and then I was trying to retrace my steps, and I had to go back and read the last couple chapters to make sure I had gotten it. And then, and then we got into the discussion, but my. You know, my main reaction to it was was I, the ending. It was almost too abrupt. Like the final twist was like, wait a minute, and then the book's over, and you're leaving us, going. You know. So he took that. 
you know, we sort of digested that and... and you know, changed it a little bit, yeah. Changed it a little bit, enough that it, it, it prevented the whiplash. The whiplash was really severe and... and well, that's still a matter of opinion, I think, but yeah. There's still a certain element of whiplash, but it wasn't as... Um, it was in a good way, yeah. <laughs> not in a bad way. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely his first reader, but it's not in process. It's, I reject it. Hello. Hello. I right, we're the last meeting, still not out. Any audio here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's our cue. So that's what I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's usually in the